two speakers who are going to share their unique perspectives. Nikita Oliver is the Executive Director of Creative Justice, an arts-based healing engaged space for youth and young adults impacted by the school to prison pipeline and other harmful systems and institutions. Uh, Nikita is also an adjunct professor at the Seattle University School of Law and a community advisor for How's Our Neighbors, an organization working on social housing in Seattle. And I want to say Nikita is also a creative, an artist, a writer, a speaker, a poet. They have been on the TEDx stage more than once, and uh, they've opened for Cornell West and Chuck D of Public Enemy. I would love to hear that story someday. And performed on the late night show with Stephen Colbert. So I would say also community, justice, and equity are woven into everything that I have seen from Nikita, and I find that very inspirational. So, uh, Nikita is joined today by Faisal Provincial, who is a Creative Justice Fellow, and we're going to hear all about that. So, I cannot wait to learn from the two of you. Welcome, Nikita and Faisal. We're going to start by giving a bit of, of perspective about where we've been. So. Um, don't worry, we're not going to speak at you yet, but I promise we're going to talk at you quite a bit. We're going to start first with a video, all right? There are a lot of programs that you hear about, let's turn the lives of the youth around, let's, you know, get them on a better path. But what we're about really is rallying together with the youth, building community with the youth, imagining with the youth can turn around the system. Creative Justice was first started. A team of folks was brought to the table, a team which included young people, public defenders, artists, prosecutors, judges, and community members, all having a conversation about how do you develop a program that is truly youth-led and truly focused on doing something different when it comes to the juvenile legal system. Before Creative Justice, I really just didn't have an outlet. Um, I initially got on board in 2016. I was coming from being incarcerated. I had just gotten out. My attorney at the time had told me about this program. I came to the program. It was a um, completely 100% welcoming space. Projects like Creative Justice have gotten the opportunity to be birthed and grow because of a movement called the No New Youth Jail Movement. Today we're hosting an event with the No New Youth Jail campaign, where the purpose and intention is to use our creative muscles, to use our imaginations, and envision a world beyond jails. We're doing that through visual art, through poetry, through small group conversations, and in the style of creative justice, we're doing that through a meal. What makes creative justice unique is that it's not just about what they learn in the classroom. They're just as involved when it comes to organizing, they're just as involved when it comes to direct action. Alternatives to incarceration are important because incarceration doesn't work. It's not serving people's health, it's not serving what these youth actually need. I believe very much that Noni Youth Jail is the direct action arm of this movement and I'm really fortunate and really honored that Creative Justice is a direct service portion of that. One of the main things that surprised me was really the fact that oppression and modern slavery and stuff like that is really like still real and in this present day. Open events like this are really important for the community because it gives us a chance to get together and build our relationships. The future that Creative Justice is supporting for incarcerated youth, it's imaginative, it's a really hopeful step outside of what we're already seeing. Really what we hope is that someday Programs like Creative Justice uh, would be an alternative. Putting you in a cage would be the alternative. It's a place to express yourself, really. Find yourself, you know, art, music, cooking, food. It's a, it's a really cool place to hang out to and meet new people. So we do things like drawing, painting, writing, poetry, music, photography. We try to bring in lots of different types of artistic disciplines when they're going through crisis. 
We rally around them with supportive mentors who are artists and activists in the community who, who love and care and respect them because we all come from the same community they do. When I was in there, it drove me crazy. I just think about my mom and how she's been in the past six years and how it put a toll on me. I get emotional about it because it'd be making me mad. It makes me sick to my stomach to see the way they treat the youth. The ones who really have deep culture and deep dark roots. So I really created that this was like another family to me. That's why I really connect with them. If programs like Creative Justice were fully supported, perhaps incarceration, especially incarceration for young people, wouldn't be necessary at all. We'd all be able to be, live in communities together, live and work and create and share our hopes and dreams, our struggles, our joys. And beautiful things happen when we gather together and really use our imagination to you know, try to change the world. So what's awesome about this video is it was scored by a young person from Creative Justice. Shout out to Kid Roman. So I'm Nikita Oliver, I use they them pronouns. I am the executive director of Creative Justice. I started with Creative Justice in 2015, originally as a mentor artist, which means I got to spend 10 weeks with young people who had active court cases in the King County Juvenile System. And through art, through conversation, through learning, reading, creating, we got to imagine a world where instead of going through the juvenile court system, what if when harm happens, young people were in arts-based healing spaces? That we do the work of stopping the cycle of harm and violence by doing the work of healing what brought a person to that in the first place. And that's not just an individual healing, that's also a collective healing. It's acknowledging that the systems we're in, the conditions around us create a world where young people have to make very hard decisions about, do I steal a phone today or do I eat? And that's not a position probably many of us right now in this room are in. It may be a position you've been in before. And our goal is how do we create spaces where young people can tell that story and they can move our communities, our society to make different decisions about how we allocate our resources and build systems where young people can thrive. And what is beautiful about creativity and beautiful about perspective is we've done the wrong thing for a lot of years. We have the opportunity to do the right thing and creativity allows us to manifest that. I'll start out by introducing myself again. My name is Faisal Provincial. I use he, him pronouns and I'm a fellow with Creative Justice. When I first heard about Creative Justice, I was about 15 years old. Uh, I was referred through my juvenile probation officer. Um, when I first arrived at Creative Justice, I was a little hesitant and nervous, you know, I didn't really, I, I wasn't really feeling the vibe. I didn't really think of myself as an artist up until that point, right? So one, a few things that really made me stay at Creative Justice was the sense of family and community I felt almost immediately. I felt like whenever I was in the space, I belonged, you know, from day one. Um, I remember, uh, so I said that I didn't think of myself as an artist back then, right? So I remember there was this uh, teaching artist who taught that first session that I was there. And she, she used to always go around and I'd be sitting there, you know, and I'd be making the art, I'd be doing the projects that they gave us, things like that. And she would come around and she'd be like, what is that you're making, Faisal? And I'd be like, it's art. She'd be like, exactly, so what are you? And I'd be like, I guess I'm an artist, you know? So it kind of stuck with me from that point. You know, I'm a 15 year old kid and I'm like, okay, I guess I can call myself an artist. And yeah, I guess that, that really stuck with me from there. I always thought of myself as an artist from that point. So you got to see a bit about our beginning. It is really important that we acknowledge the movement that our work was creative, created off of. It's the No New Youth Jail Movement. In 2012, King County voters voted to build a new, what was then called the Youth and Family Justice Center. And 1% from every capital project in King County has to go to public arts through Four Culture, which y'all are creatives, you probably know that. But there were some really innovative thinkers at Four Culture at that time. And they decided what if instead of using all of this money for public art that the community may not recognize or even know, what if we invested seed money 
and establishing a pipeline for young people out of the juvenile carceral system that is creative, that is healing, that is community-based, and created, um, thought about public art as not just something you, you visibly see, but also something that we use to develop community and to develop the world we want to live in. Uh, this is our very first session at Washington Hall. So we've been at Washington Hall since 2017. In the early years of creative justice, we would stack all the chairs, all the art supplies, all the tables into the back of our co -direct, my co-director's car, Aaron Counts, and we would drive it all over the county. And it was an incredible blessing when Washington Hall reopened and Black Power Unlimited invited us to have a classroom there. It meant that young people would always have a place to find us. It meant that we would have a stable place to create and share art. And it offered us a really beautiful community in that hall with a robust number of arts-based organizations, Black and Indigenous-led organizations, to build a community where young people would feel welcomed. So our very first program that we started with was our base program, Building, Affirming, Strengthening Experiences. And it was just a space to come make art. No agenda. Maybe we'd write a poem. Maybe we would jointly paint a painting. And we would just have conversation, food, conversation, make art, low barrier, no expectations. And young people after one session would usually tell us they weren't ready to leave. Uh, so we had to figure out how do you go from having what was intended to be just one session with each youth and have an opportunity for young people to stay plugged in for as long as they wanted to. We also offer a stipend because how many of y'all have artists worked for free a lot? Yeah. <laughs> And we want to acknowledge that, like building your craft, learning your skills, that is time. And in a capitalist society, it's also money. And we know that for a lot of young people, the reason they're pushed into the school to prison pipeline in the first place is a lack of access to economic opportunity. So while they get to build art skills, do healing work, we also pay them a stipend as acknowledgement for the importance of their time and a way to keep them out of things they might engage in the streets. So our next program we developed was the Youth Leadership Board. Uh, these two lovely young people, Cookie and Nani, were two of our first youth leaders. Faisal was also on our youth leadership board. And the goal was to, instead of folks like me making decisions about what programs we added, young people could tell us what they wanted. And then we would pursue the funding and facilitate the opportunity to make that exist. And so our first youth leadership board really led the charge of starting to imagine what would it look like if we had program programming every day of the week. If instead of 15 young people, we had 70 young people. Instead of one mentor artist, we had 10 mentor artists. And we've, in the last 10 years, we celebrate our 10-year anniversary in December, have gone from 15 young people in one base program session to 75 young people across seven programs. A good example of creative justice being uh, responsive to what the youth want is the Restitution Relief Fund. So most people don't know that in Washington State, juvenile records are automatically sealed unless you still owe restitution. Restitution includes financial obligations, and if a youth or family cannot pay them, then your record, it basically stays open, right? This is like moving through society with a scarlet letter on your head. It's hard to get jobs, go to school, and it's hard to even get an apartment. As you can imagine, this makes it hard for a youth to move forward and live a positive and healthy life. At one point, I was one of these young people. I didn't know my restitution went unpaid. I got a job offer that I was really excited about. But when they ran my background, a charge from when I was only 14 years old came back up. It was still visible because my record was not sealed yet. So they withdrew that job offer like almost immediately, right? CJ worked with me and other youth to start the restitution relief fund so that young people could move forward in life without their juvenile record hanging around their necks. The Restitution Relief Fund ensures that no youth has to, say, has to face the same barriers that I did. That's the Restitution Relief Fund. And I just want to give props to Faisal, literally created because of him and his advocacy. So another incredible program that was developed because of young people and their leadership was the Youth Consortium. Originally, a partnership between Rainier Beach Action Coalition community passageways and creative justice create spaces where young people could advocate for policy and budgetary changes that would allow them to have the resources to create the world they want to live in. And in particular, thinking about neighborhoods like Rainier Beach and like the Central District, 
where black community members have, have been, essentially we've been pushed out, priced out, not able to stay in our, our spaces that we've helped to culturally build up. And so young people started advocating for housing. Um, and our first project we worked on was the Youth Achievement Center, which will be built near Columbia City. It is for us, by us housing, uh, where young people are deciding what services are inside that building, but also getting to design it and think about how buildings um, exist in space. And do you have a garden? Do you have a basketball court? Do you have a doctor's office in there? What, what actually makes that a space where young people feel held and seen and their families can be well cared for? Over time, the Youth Consortium has evolved into an inside-out strategy. We organize with folks currently in Washington State DOC who went in as children. So in the state of Washington, you can be declined from juvenile court to adult court and face an adult sentence. Um, many of these folks went in during the 90s and the early 2000s and are doing work to try to change our current state laws so that young people don't have to face those same consequences because we know there are better ways to help heal harm and make sure that young people do not repeat the same behaviors. The restitution relief, or the cons youth consortium puts out a zine every six months that has poetry, images, and tells stories about the organizing and advocacy that young people and folks inside are currently leading. Makerspace is a great example of a program that helps young people use their skills to be sustainable. Makerspace is a program of creative justice that partners with master teaching artists and cultural workers to show young people how their, old, how their arts and cultural skills can both uplift the community and support them economically. Youth have created candles, body lotions, oils and teas, and they're now learning how to sew working with an amazing textile artist. The part I love most about Makerspace is the garden project. We facilitate the garden project April through September where youth learn how to build plant beds and how to grow food from seedling all the way to harvest. We even use the food the youth grow for weekly meals during the summertime. We have like a chef that cooks the meals and we use like the greens and the broccoli and the onions, it's pretty nice. Um, I love how the garden teaches you the importance of sustainability and the peace it gives you while tending to the garden, it's like no other peace in my opinion. That was like the first time I ever did a garden so it was like, it was perfect. The summertime, water in the plants, it was very peaceful. That's the, that's Makerspace. <laughs> so Faisal is also going to talk about our heel circles where he has been one of our um, first two heel apprentices. We have in partnership with an um, arts therapist developed a circle healing practice that leverages both um, artistic tools to process trauma and tell stories, as well as using, uh, we've been trained in the Clinkett Circle practice on how can we create less hierarchical spaces where young people feel more comfortable opening up and sharing truths, but also having the opportunity to process those creatively. Heal uh, is a space where participants can come together and have courageous conversations about trauma, accountability, harm, oppressive systems, and how we navigate these things in a healthier and a more healing way. We developed the first Hill Circle in collaboration with Collective Justice. First learning skills from the curriculum developed with loved ones incarcerated at the Monroe Penitentiary. In partnership with our Hill Arts therapist, Delisha, we have worked together to develop our own curriculum. Through conversations, circle practice, and art making, we process our emotions, needs, and boundaries and how those interact with other people's emotions, needs, and boundaries. This space has personally taught me how to deal with my emotions in a more healthier way. It's helped me learn how to set boundaries with my own family and close relationships, close friends, and how to take care of myself in a more intentional manner. Rather than coping through substances or reactionary behavior, I'm able to slow down and process what's happening. I'm able to make decisions from a sense of clarity and groundedness in my values. This has helped me become a better father and partner and honestly just a better, better young adult in general. And can you all give it up for Faisal? This is the very first presentation. Right? Yeah. First one, guys. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm a little nervous, but I feel better now. So uh, how many of y'all are communications professionals? Awesome. We know that this is a growing field. We want to make sure young people have access to these tools and the opportunities. They know it exists. Like, 
if I'd known I could have been a graphic designer, I'm not gonna lie, y'all, I might have not gone to law school. <laughs> um, spend time making beautiful things. Um, so we have started uh, creating a youth-led communications campaign. We started first with the Recess podcast, and we do that in partnership with Converge Media, a black-owned media company here in the Pacific Northwest, where young people generate for us biased content, thinking about how do you talk to another young person about mental health or substance use or goals in your dreams, and how do you do that well, and what makes that engaging? How do you leverage the internet, YouTube, in-person conversations? And so they're building those skills, learning how to book artists, um, how do you write a script, how to use a teleprompter. Teleprompters are hard. They move, you're trying to talk at the same time, and they're doing incredible learning how to leverage those skills. We also partner with Real Change, where monthly young people get to write a column. And when we first told young people, we're gonna have you write something, they looked at me a little bit crazy. Um, but now they love it. They love getting to sit down and think about how do I tell a story with my words? How do I do that in a way that moves an audience? And if it's news related, what makes journalism good? How can you tell something factually in a way that someone can receive and also do it ethically? And then last but not least, Bessa, one of our local town legends, has started a show on Q13 Fox and allows us to each week bring a two to three minute uh, youth unfiltered segment where young people can talk about something happening in the city and tie it back to why it's important to them. All right, the fellowship program. And you know, the fellowship program, it's another great example of creative justice again, being responsive to the youth needs, right? So I asked Nikita when I came back to creative justice, I said, you know what, Nikita, I want to stay on. I want to be a staff member. This is what I want to do, right? And after that, Nikita made the fellowship program, a two-year program uh, for fellows that are all involved in creative justice. And it's a full-time, fully benefited, so they get 401ks just like all the rest of the staff. They get full health care. Um, our goal for our next cohort is that starting salary is 75000 We want to make sure that we honor young people and that we don't take advantage of both their interests. And honestly, I know if I ask Faisal to do anything, he'll do it. He really does. He really does. I asked him, can you help me clean the kitchen today? And he did it. Spent two hours cleaning the kitchen. So we don't want to take advantage of young people's interests. We also want them to get to like comfortably learn. It is very hard to learn when you are in fight or flight mode. And the young people that we want to be running creative justice in the future are those who have had to access it as a support and resource. And if we're going to get there, we have to intentionally cultivate that leadership and make sure that they have all the tools that they need. Ideally, this is my future ED. Maybe, hopefully. <laughs> You want me to talk about the cafe? Okay, so uh, similar to how when Faisal was like, hey Nikita, I wanna work here, what are my options? Young people saw a space in our building that could hold a cafe. There was one there before the pandemic started. It shuttered like many things. And we partnered with Black Power Unlimited to reopen that cafe. But to do so in a space where young people have access to jobs and opportunity, they have access to wraparound services, they get a labor rights curriculum. How many of y'all don't maybe still are learning your rights in your workplace? Be real, it's okay. Me too. I'll be learning laws all the time. We want young people to go into their workplaces and know what are your rights as a worker. So a part of the Creative Cafe internship is a labor rights curriculum. They learn about all the parts of coffee from roasting to barista training to how do you fix a machine? Did you know that the espresso machine fixer job is the most important? Like, it's the least filled in the industry, second highest paid, and they don't have enough technicians. Yeah. So we're trying to make sure young people have access to that training, they have access to that opportunity. And coffee is something you can do anywhere in the world. Coffee is everywhere, so they can travel. And we do this in honor of Rob Wahapti, who uh, created Hidmo. Uh, Hidmo was an all ages hip hop venue in the Central District. It was the very first of its kind. Um, and Rahua passed in 2020, so we do this work in honor of her. Last but not least, we want young people to have access to a venue management program, an audiovisual internship, and culinary arts. We are well on our way to a venue management program. We are now partnering with Black Power Unlimited to run the whole first floor of Washington Hall. So if you are looking for a space to rent, for a hybrid meeting, um, for a dinner, for a dance class, for an arts class, please 
visit us. Everything that you contribute to our venue actually goes right back to making sure that young people have access to jobs and opportunity and that our space can stay open. Um, I just want to say in closing before Faisal closes us out, a lot of gratitude to y'all for inviting us into space to share with you about our work. Um, I also want to tell our, our Indigo folks, we kind of want to host our tenure here, so <laughs> I don't know where you're at, but I'm putting it in your ear. Uh, <laughs> And we're just really grateful to have the opportunity to get to change the world with, with what we love, which is art and creativity, and hold space where young people can do their own healing work, they can talk about accountability, but we can also acknowledge that changing systems and changing the world is not just about changing individuals, it is also about changing communities and transforming the ways that we engage with each other, from our spending to our relationships to what we create. So I hope that you'll join us on that journey. I just wanted to say thank you to Indigo and Creative Mornings for inviting us into your space and letting us share about the dope work that we do at Creative Justice. And honestly, I'm looking forward to connecting with a lot of you, like Nikita said, probably Indigo. You know, we're going to be back. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I think we're going to open it up for some questions and answers for a little bit. Hi. Um, obviously, there's a lot of creative professionals in the room, so I guess my first question is how can we, how can we get involved with any of these? I know it's a lot youth-led, but as adults, how can we uh, help you guys out? Yes, there's a few ways. So um, we have mentor artists, folks that come in and partner with young people on whatever creative projects they've identified. Sometimes we do that based on an open call. Um, and sometimes if we have a list of folks that, you know, various creatives we know are interested in things, if we have a need that comes up, like, uh, for instance, we're going to be designing one of the covers for Real Change, we might need someone who actually understands <laughs> how to do that. So, um, yeah, you can email us at creativejusticenw at gmail.com. And if you have a particular creative skill set that, that you would like to share with young people, we'll add you to our roster of artists and we'll reach out as projects come up. We also have community action projects every quarter. So in March, we have a community action project that is usually a smaller one where it's kind of like a recital. Young people get to practice talking in front of people, practice performing, practice sharing their visual art. It's like so weird when people are staring at your art and you're like there. Um, and so <laughs> then learning how to be in space and have conversations with folks about their work. Uh, we're having a really big community action project on, on June 20th at Washington Hall. Anyone know what wonderful holiday happens that week? <laughs> Juneteenth, yeah. So we want to be able to tie in um, liberation work with artistic and creative work. And so we'll have tons of artists and vendors. Young people will perform. There will be food. There will be fun. There will be connecting. So that's June 20th, um, coming through and supporting them, putting their art out into the world. And if you happen to manage a space where young people could put their art up, that would also be a wonderful way to be able to partner and build with you so they can get it out into the world. You mentioned our building a few times. Where are you located? That is great. We are located not far from you, actually. If you go right up Yesler to Washington Hall, it is on 14th and Fur. And another way that you could support us is our cafe is open 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday through Friday. And we have internet, very fast internet. Very good coffee. about some of the choices of the path you guys were doing at Creative Justice and what you all did to work through it and how that felt? I'd say the most recent would be when we started the Hill Circle. We were developing the curriculum almost from scratch, kind of just from our experiences and the things that we learned from the organization that we partnered with, Collective Justice. So I'd say in the beginning, I think because I was fairly new to um, healing circles and basically fairly new about talking about my feelings, and my experiences, traumas, you know, and, you know, past things like that. It was very intimidating for me as a young person, you know, as a young man specifically. Um, what kind of got me through that was just the community and the people around me. And specifically, I spoke about her earlier. Her name's Delicia. She's the art therapist that um, helps me facilitate the Hill Circles. She kind of helped me get over that barrier and understand, like, the benefits of the kind of topics that we go through in Hill and the benefits of the curriculum that we're building for these youth in the space, you know? So I started to really understand how much I was getting from it and how much I was changing in a good way throughout like, you know, 
in my relationships like with my girlfriend or with my mom or my brothers and my sisters and how I'm moving through life in a more healthy way. Um, I just really understand the importance that those, those young boys and girls at Creative Justice need this kind of understanding about their own emotions, other people's emotions, their own bodies, you know, things like that. So I guess, I don't know if that answered your question, but that was kind of a barrier that I had to get over and that's something that helped me. Um, thank you, first of all, it was super inspiring. What, um, what was the biggest perspective shift that you've had through this journey? Oh, that's deep. That's <laughs> deep. The biggest perspective shift I've had through this journey, I would say that understanding that the choices that I made in life are sometimes bigger than what I thought it was. Sometimes there's outside factors that tie into you know the things that I had to do or the choices that I made and the places that I've been um, I guess just understanding that a lot of things were on me but at the same time there's you know sometimes there's things on the outside that influence my decisions right I don't know if that makes sense but I guess that was like something I had to realize that yeah, it's not always like me. I don't know. To try to understand the conditions. Yeah, exactly. Understand the conditions that, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, for me, as a lawyer, I have partnered with young people, and as an artist, partnered with young people and supported them through very regular court processes where they never get support. They're not, like, we also do rental support. We do basic needs support, like, full wraparound services. And watch them go through that system and just keep ending back up in it. A creative justice, seeing young people have the opportunity to make mistakes and be cared for when those make mistakes occur, whether that's in art. Because, you know, sometimes the risk or the mistake in an art project actually becomes the thing that you realize is, oh, that's a cool new technique. Or you realize that didn't work and you go back and you redo it. And seeing, having had 10 years now of experience, young people actually do better generally in life when they have spaces where they do have self-determination and decision-making, that a young person never has in a court process. I don't know how many of y'all have been to court, but if you're the defendant, you usually don't speak. You're silent. And for a child going through that process, whose parent isn't even allowed to really advocate with them or for them. It is even more, um, locks you into a pathway. And having the opportunity to see what happens when young people's pathways and supports are expanded, nine times out of 10, they actually never get in trouble again. We have very low recidivism. And so the perspective that I get from that is knowing that we are on the right path of the work that we're doing, even though sometimes people don't understand it. And to be quite frank, most of us are more comfortable allowing another system to deal with harm than for us to get skilled up on how do we intervene and heal harm when it happens in our own communities. Which to Faisal's point, when you learn those skills, you can address harm at home, at work, outside, um, and even in bigger situations when we have those skills. So perspective is, we all need to build those skills. Not just Faisal, not just me, not just kids who get in trouble. The more we have skills of knowing how to be in healthy relationship, the better all of our communities are going to be. Can we give a very warm thank you? <laughs> okay.